What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Rewired Soul Podcast. It's your host, Chris, and we have another great episode for you today. Today, I am talking with Ron Purser, all right? So, aside from being a professor, he wrote a book called McMindfulness, and check it out. So, real quick story, real quick story before we jump into this podcast. So, uh, as many of you know, I'm in recovery from addiction. I just celebrated nine years drug and alcohol free, right? And uh, about a year or two into my recovery, I came across mindfulness. I kept hearing about mindfulness every which way, mindfulness for this, mindfulness for that. And I was like, I wonder if they have mindfulness for addiction recovery. I read a book and I just became obsessed with mindfulness. And uh, yeah, I taught mindfulness to my son. I saw positive changes in him. I taught it to my clients at the rehab treatment center. And and yeah, like while, while mindfulness was very helpful to me, right? I, I saw that there were some issues, but it it really took my sobriety to the next level. So like, even though I had some criticisms, you know, much like 12 step programs, I'm like, listen, it's net positive, whatever. So, so yeah, uh, Ron, he wrote this book called McMindfulness, uh, talking about some of the issues around, you know, the mindfulness industry and some of the ways people are making money off of it and some of the claims about it and everything. And I read it when it first came out and I was just like, every defense mechanism in me went off. I'm like, nope, screw this, you know, whatever. Well, anyways, I recently reread the book this year after reading a bunch of books on, you know, the the quote unquote happiness industry and, you know, all the self-help gurus and, you know, just how, you know, the United States, we have this kind of individualist society where they sell you on the idea that your problems are 1000% under your control. And, and the conversation needs to be a lot more nuanced than that because there are, you know, different privileges, there are different disadvantages and things like that. So anyways, I gave Ron's book another try and I, I binged it. it. It just hit me in a different way. And I've mentioned this with other books before, but I think it's important to always remember that, you know, we, we hit different, you know, quote unquote chapters in our lives and we might not like a book at one point or disagree with it. And then we read it later and it hits us differently. Right. So that's why I love giving books a different chance and, or a second chance and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, I absolutely love Ron's book. Um, especially because, you know, in the, over the last year I've been really learning about like just wealth inequality and just, you know, all these different issues, uh, going on in the world. So yeah, I, I I really enjoyed this book. So anyways, anyways, Ron and I have been trying to set something up for a long time. And I will link his book as well as his uh, social media down below. Um, and yeah, uh, I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I hope you do too. But before I get started, make sure you are following me over on Instagram and Twitter at The Rewired Soul. I got a bunch of cool stuff coming, a bunch of great episodes, and the best way to make sure that you don't miss miss anything the best way to get in touch with me like yo my dms are open so if you have like book suggestions or just want to reach out if you have any suggestions for the podcast make sure you're following me on instagram and twitter at the rewired soul but anyways without further ado here's my conversation with ron purser about his book mick mindfulness Hello, Ron, and thank you for coming on the Rewired Soul podcast. Yeah, love the book. So glad that you're here so we could discuss and, yeah, talk about some of the things that you dove into in the book. So, so yeah, to kick this thing off, uh, for those who haven't read it, the, the premise of the book is that mindfulness has been used to kind of push this neoliberal and capitalist agenda, right? So something I loved about the book is how you really break down the fact that our capitalist society has pushed self-help on us in order to make us kind of ignore all of the systemic issues such as like wealth inequality and racism. 
So, so yeah, can you, can you kind of discuss um, why you believe, you know, it's not helpful for us to take this individualistic approach and why you believe that, you, you know, it's kind of not a great thing to teach people that we're 100% control of our problems and, and how we perceive the issues going on in our life. Mindfulness is portrayed in the media and understood as an individualizing activity among psychologists and its proponents. And mindfulness is more often than not complicit with neoliberal values as it's framed as an instrumental and privatized practice. So the implicit message of mindfulness is that it is the individual who needs to learn to adapt to changing social, political, and economic conditions. There's very little attention paid to the importance of collective action or participating in a community, and one constantly hears the trope among mindfulness teachers that the only real change comes from within. So in this respect, mindfulness is producing the ideal neoliberal subject. As neoliberalism has deregulated markets and taken control of governments, to ensure market-friendly policies, this notion of governance becomes self-governance of supposedly free and autonomous individuals. So similar to the help genre, much of the mindfulness discourse, both in scientific journals and in the popular media, valorizes individual autonomy, freedom, choice, and authenticity. It's awash in this biomedical and therapeutic language, and the discourse of mindfulness reframes individuals' predicaments and life circumstances as a product of their individual choices. So personal troubles are never attributed to political or socioeconomic conditions, but instead they're always framed as psychological in nature and often diagnosed as personal pathologies. So the mandate, then, that individuals must self-regulate by taking responsibility for their own self-care, stress, and well-being, if they're going to be employable and thrive in a precarious economy. So it amounts to a political and economic ideology that views human beings as best understood as being entrepreneurs of themselves, sort of running their own private personal enterprise. And the ideological linchpin is the individualization of all social phenomena. The burden of change, then, is placed squarely, then, on the individual. The individual has to adapt. The individual has to adjust and live harmoniously uh, with the conditions uh, that anyone finds themselves in. So, as John Kabat-Zinn, the founder of Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, MBSR. He's very fond of quipping, uh, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. And it's it's this weird balance. And we'll, we'll dive into it uh, a little bit more later. But uh, but yeah, it, it's books books like yours that I, I fell in love with because I, for a long time, had this very individualist uh, uh, approach and outlook on life. I, I believed in the whole idea of like meritocracy and all that. And one of the things I got really into were books on just kind of the issues with this belief in this like meritocracy and, and hey, you work hard, you're in control and you could do this. And, and I, I get why there's like benefits to, you know, the internal locus of control and all that. Um, kind of like you mentioned and discussed in the book is, is it it doesn't focus enough on the 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 wider issues and how we need to kind of come together and talk about the bigger problems and when we just purely focus on ourselves and what we're doing wrong and how we perceive things we can neglect trying to make this this you know this whole world better and that's that's where i get you know kind of torn because yes there are things that we have to do on an individual level but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be working for systemic change, which is a lot of what you argue in the book. And like I said, you know, we're gonna we're gonna dive into that a little bit more. But uh, but yeah, very very well said. So um, to kind of follow up on that last question, uh, something I'm I'm curious about, and I'm wondering your thoughts on this. Why 
why do you think the self-help industry is so successful, right? Like I just went to the bookstore uh, for the first time uh, since the uh, pandemic and things are reopening and the self-help section is just popping, right? Ton of books, ton of people looking at those books and all that. So, so it, it almost seems to me that at, at some point we, 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 we almost have to like want to believe that our problems are, are like, you know, of our own making and we're in total control. So do you think that this is like a form of self-deception to believe that we're more in control than, uh, than we actually are? Or is there another reason why we love, you know, self-help and kind of neglect the realities of what's going on? One of the major reasons the self-help industry is so successful is because it is a perfect complement to a neoliberal ethos. As neoliberalism has deregulated markets to ensure market-friendly uh, policies, we see then this characterization of mindfulness as a turning inward to a private interior inner subjectivity a subjective activity that's carried out in isolation from the wider social, political, and economic structures. And this, this sort of view of, this privatized view of mindfulness has dominated the popular imagination. And this brings us to the key tenet of neoliberal mindfulness, I call it neoliberal mindfulness, is that the source of problems is located inside the heads of individuals. And again, this is particularly accentuated with the pathologizing and medicalization of stress, which then requires a remedy, an expert treatment, and mindfulness-based interventions are then offered as the cure. It's very, very convenient. It's an ideological message that if you can't alter your circumstances, if you can't change the causes of your distress, just practice mindfulness, just self-manage, self-regulate, and change your reactions to your circumstances. But this assumes that our mental states and emotional well-being are sort of self-contained. It's, it's a very reductionistic view that such states have a force of their own and that they're contingent. In other words, they simply come and go. But what's missing in this mindfulness rhetoric is that a lot of our bodily discomfort or emotional upset, our stresses and anxieties, can also be rooted in objective social and physical circumstances. So I think of neoliberal mindfulness then as kind of a conformist opiate, telling us we only need to turn off, tune out, and drop in. It's sort of a spin on Timothy Leary's uh, slogan. In other words, turn off critical questioning and inquiry, tune out the social and material world, and drop into the interiority of our private self. And this retreat to isolated and interior worlds, this it's kind of a mindful quietism. It's very confluent then with neoliberal conditioning that views suffering and distress as originating inside individuals. So yes, uh, the mindfulness in industry is sending a message that individuals are fully responsible for their own mental well-being, that they only need to learn how to self-manage and self-manage their own mental space and self-regulate their feelings and emotions. So it, it's a very simplistic notion that as long as I'm mindful, I'm okay. And it kind of amounts to a form of magical thinking essentially hypnotizing people into submission by presenting stress as a maladaptive uh, psychophysiological reaction. And by kind of subscribing to this depoliticized uh, narrative of stress, then there's no need for any kind of critical inquiry into systemic institutional and structural causes of our uh, distress. And in that sense, mindfulness practices, as they're currently conceived and taught, really don't permit any critique or debate of what might be unjust, culturally toxic, or environmentally destructive 
uh, either it's a you know corporate workplace, uh, whatever it may be. Rather, the mindful imperative is to simply accept things as they are, which is a, a trope you hear a lot, uh, while practicing non-judgmental present moment awareness. But <laughs> when it's done in that way, it kind of functions ideologically as a social anesthesia, preserving the status quo. So by turning off and tuning out and dropping in, mindfulness is delinked from our larger social and material systems, and it's bound to the cult of the self. It promotes the idea that I need to fix myself before I fix the world, and so basically deferring any kind of political engagement. And at the same time, uh, the social and political and cultural stressors around us continue unabated. I, I I absolutely love it, and I I hope I hope right now, like I hope everybody is getting a, a, a copy of the book because this is something that you know uh, it's it's so difficult, and it feels it almost feels like you know those those people are even conspiracy theorists. Like I've talked to a lot of people who debunk conspiracy theorists, but it's like you know I can hear somebody like kind of taking in what what you're saying and what the book talks about, like like you know saying like oh oh this is just you know uh, them saying that I. I'm not really seeing the world as it is, but but it's true. Like when we're talking about stress, when we're talking about workplaces, we're talking about shutting off our minds and not questioning things and everything like that. Like, you know, um, this is, you know, this is one of the reasons I've been questioning capitalism and, you know, our whole hustle culture and everything like that. Like I'm a natural workaholic. It's just something that I do, you know what I mean? But I've had to learn to tone tone it down. But anyways, if I, if I understand you correctly, like, you know, if, if we're teaching people or we're, we're promoting mindfulness to, you know, look inward and stop questioning things like, oh, no, 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 no. Your stress isn't coming from, you know, the fact that you have to work 40, 60 hours uh, for, you know, for pennies, right? Uh, you know, don't, don't question that. The stress isn't coming from that. The stress is coming from within you and how you're perceiving this. And, you know, mindfulness does teach us non-judgmental awareness and all that. And, you know, uh, and, and I'll always say, like, mindfulness helped me so much with my emotional regulation and all these other things. But, you know, even, you know, in 12-step programs, I had to start, you know, finding the, the balance of, yeah, there are things in my control and not within my control, right? But I also had to look broader and say, okay, okay, okay. Why is our system set up the way it is? Why are CEOs making thousands of times more than people who are working their asses off on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Why aren't we looking at these things and questioning these things? And, and yeah, um, you know, we're about to kind of talk about, you know, corporations and everything like that who are promoting, you know, self-help and mindfulness. But like, it's, it's something that I think we all need to think about the way our system is set up, where you have these, these multimillionaire, multi-billionaire CEOs or, you know, even upper management and stuff like that, who aren't working nearly as much, but they're using some of the company profits to pay for mindfulness teachers to come in and get you to stop questioning these things or how to deal with the stress. And here, how can I teach my employees to manage their stress better so they work until they're about to, you know, die, right? And, and it's nuts that we don't really see it like that. And I think a lot of us need to look at that. Like I'm all about hard work and everything, but we do at some point need to question, you know, like, hey, why are the structures like this? Why, why are these people getting paid so much more? Are, is their work that much more valuable? Like, um, but you know, I hate, I hate it because the word gaslighting is so overused. But it's like, are people being gaslit into thinking that their problems aren't real and all they need to do is just be a little bit, you know, more mindful? But anyways, yeah, I could, <laughs> I could go on about that forever. But um, yeah, speaking of, you know, these, these companies and corporations and, you know, bringing in mindfulness trainers and, you know, like John Kabat-Zinn and everybody like, you know, they go and they do seminars and teach and a lot of them get paid tens of thousands of dollars, but that's a whole nother topic. But anyways, something I really love about your book is it's constantly going back to like ethics and questioning ethics and, you know, is this right? And that's something I'm really interested in because something I noticed a while ago is that these like multi 
billion dollar companies invest in, you know, uh, these speakers to come in and, you know, different trainings to teach people. And not only that, but like psychologists, authors I've read, um, speakers, you know, they're making this money, uh, you know, and they're, they're talking to these people. But here's the thing. So they're paying, the corporations are paying all this money for these people to come in and teach uh, people how to like manage stress and work harder. But it doesn't seem like, you know, the speakers or the people coming in to teach uh, mindfulness or even self-help in other ways, it doesn't seem like they really question what the company does. So in your opinion, is it unethical for these mindfulness gurus to go in and help companies that are objectively making the world a worse place? And for those who have spent their lives practicing mindfulness or even positive psychology, how do you think, you know, the, the speakers and uh, authors and everything, how do you think they justify doing this? Like when you're going into a company that's just terrible for this world, you know what I mean? We can see how uh, the self-help industry has been accompanied by an explosion of self-styled experts, whether they're gurus or life coaches, consultants, and trainers. I call them spiritual entrepreneurs who, all ha who have all sorts of hacks and remedies to enable individuals to improve their minds and bodies, relationships and careers, whatever it may be. And mindfulness is no different. Corporate mindfulness programs, however, can be quite lucrative. So it's no surprise that the spiritual entrepreneurs have gravitated to marketing and selling mindfulness programs to corporations. It's a burgeoning industry. And for many, their livelihood depends on selling these programs and securing contracts. And like you mentioned, many of these teachers have practiced some forms of mindfulness. But I think we have to step back and ask, are these mindfulness consultants really going to deal with and address the root causes of stress in corporations? I would have to answer definitively no. First, corporate mindfulness programs are focused on individual stress relief, and the diagnosis has already been made before even beginning such a program. We know, however, from the research on workplace stress that the real causes of stress are not the failure of individuals to cope or a lack of concentration or focus, but really uh, more systemic and structural factors, such as unrealistic job demands, long work hours, bad bosses, a lack of autonomy or discretion in one's work, a lack of health care, uh, fear of layoffs uh, or downsizing. But those celebrating uh, the mindfulness movement, especially those doing work in corporations, uh, sort of have ignored uh, these, these larger systemic and structural causes. Uh, there's one author, uh, David Gellis. Um, he's an author of a popular book called Mindful Work about mindfulness in corporations. And this is a quote from him. He says, stress isn't something imposed on us it's something we impose on ourselves. So there you go. There you have it. It's it's kind of like the poster child for neoliberal mindfulness, that, that sort of statement. Um, so when we're trying to address stress in the workplace at the individual level, through individual level therapeutic mindfulness interventions, it's really going to uh, avoid addressing uh, the structural and material conditions that are the real causes of much of... Uh, 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 workplace stress. So while there may be some positive side effects and some modest level of individual stress relief for employees, there's an ethical dilemma here as, as you're raising the question. There's an ethical dilemma in that the deployment of corporate mindfulness programs essentially lets management off the hook for taking responsibility for toxic and stressful uh, conditions in the workplace. Another way to look at this is that mindfulness in corporations is a form of iotrogenesis. And iotrogenesis is a medical term that is defined as any injury or illness that 
occurs as a result of medical care. And mindfulness-based interventions, uh, interestingly enough, are clinical treatments that have a lineage to biomedicine. So I think we have to consider here the deeper iotrogenic uh, effects of mindfulness interventions. And corporate mindfulness trainers and teachers, they perform kind of a slate of hand, uh, offsetting uh, systemic fallibility as individual culpability. And iotrogenesis provides both the cancer and the cure, if you want to think about it in those terms. The source of much stress and the means of cope leaves uh, these systems under critiqued while the individual is expected to adjust. So we have a serious ethical issue because corporate, corporate mindfulness programs may do more harm than good in the long run because they obfuscate the deeper transformation and systemic changes that are actually needed. So we have a situation then where individual employees are taught through individualized mindfulness techniques how to basically endure the exploitive conditions of a system that's largely based on this uh, neoliberal logic. And the causes of organizational problems then can be uh, uh, reframed as uh, located within employees rather than in organizational structures or corporate culture or management policies. Um, so that's a, that's a key issue, I think. But basically, it all comes down to the bottom line when we're talking about corporate mindfulness programs. Because the primary reason for using and offering corporate mindfulness programs is that they can be justified as a cost-efficient way of enhancing performance and productivity. And corporate mindfulness trainers, especially those here in Silicon Valley where I am, yes, um, I've met many of them, and, and many of them are very sincere, but extremely naive. And they truly believe that they're making the world a better place by offering mindfulness training. But it's sort of cultic. Um, they're true believers in mindfulness, so it's understandable that they can easily put these difficult ethical questions aside. And if their financial livelihood is at stake, that's even more so. So in some ways, these naive idealists are more dangerous and they view any sort of pushback or critique as incredulous. Like, why are you stopping me from saving saving humanity? Yeah, and that that's a whole nother, you know, just ethical angle that you touched on that I, I, I hadn't even really thought about. Like, is it is it ethical to go in there and, you know, just kind of turn a blind eye like you mentioned, you know, uh, is anybody going to come in there and like criticize, you know, the corporate structure, right? Like I imagine, you know, going in there and saying, hey, what, what, what are some examples of the problems you're dealing with? And, you know, I just imagine some guy saying, hey, I'm working six, six days a week, 14 hours a day, don't get to see my family, barely making enough to, you know, pay my bills and da-da-da-da-da. Like that mindfulness coach or teacher who they brought in and paid tens of thousands of dollars to come speak or do a seminar, he's not going to bite the hand that feeds and says, oh, well, you guys should collectively get together and talk to management or unionize or, you know, whatever. Like, that that's what's crazy. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I really enjoy uh, reading books on just, like, decision-making and our own thinking errors and, uh, you know, biases and, you know, studies and research is, you know, uh, there's a there's a whole, you know, a whole assortment of studies around like motivated reasoning. And something that I always try to think about is who is giving me this information and do they have any incentive to say this the way they're saying it, right? And that's something that we have to think about if somebody, you know, if a corporate mindfulness coach is coming in, it's like, okay, why are they here? Are they doing this for free? Probably not. Are they getting paid? Yes. How much? Okay. Right. And, and then I have to think about that and say, okay, so this is why, you know, they have a very good reason, even if it's not something that they're consciously doing, but they have a very good reason to tell me not to worry about how, like, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, an issue with how many hours I'm working or how little I get to see my family. It's more of, you know, make sure those, those two hours with your family that you see them at night, make sure that you're mindful and in the moment rather than saying like, Hey, why don't you have more time with your family? Or don't, don't worry about, you know, uh, 
why you're not getting paid nearly enough, you know, to, you know, support yourself and why you have to have a second job or a side hustle or whatever. Like, they're not going to tell you that they're going to say, Hey, you know, be mindful. And, and what about the things that you don't need that you're trying to spend money on? And, and that's, that's where it, it feels like they're playing mind games. But as you mentioned, like a lot of them are sincere and they believe they're changing the world, but What's, what's that saying? There's like some famous quote, like, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, choose not to know when they're, you know, or, or something like that, like when, they're, when their paycheck depends on not knowing. You know what I mean? So I, I, I do believe that, you know, uh, at a certain point, some people are just deceiving themselves because they have to because that's where their paycheck comes from. That's how they provide for their family. That's how, you know, if they make a, a, a huge amount of money, it gives them more time to spend with their loved ones. And it's, it's this, this, this kind of twisted thing. And one of the reasons why I'm so so big on just you know we got to think about each other and stuff and if we have to give up something from ourselves to help the greater good and help more people then we really need to look at that and, you know that's just my my personal thoughts <laughs> on the situation and i know all of us you know our, our morality is different but that's just something i i try to think of like if if i have to take a little bit of a hit for the greater good like so be it you know what i mean um but, but yeah, so uh, continuing, um, you know, with the ethical conversation, um, I wanted to ask you a similar question because uh, in the book, in McMindfulness, you talk about mindfulness being taught to the military. And I remember reading um, uh, the, uh, the, the Skeptic's Guide to Mindfulness from uh, uh, Dan, who, who wrote uh, 10% Happier. But anyways, uh, I remember reading his second book and about teaching, you know, military people, you know, mindfulness. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I read your book. And I'm like, wait a second. Maybe this isn't the best idea. So can you kind of explain why, uh, in your opinion, um, why mindfulness uh, being taught to soldiers is kind of like this, this conflict of principles with like the core of Buddhist philosophy? When you reduce mindfulness to a technique, then you can easily separate it from the ethic of non-violence and non-harming, which is part of, obviously, Buddhist philosophy. And that's what's happened in the military. Mindfulness has been weaponized and used to train U.S. military soldiers even before they're deployed uh, to battlefields. We're not talking about using mindfulness uh, to treat PTSD. We're talking about preparing warriors uh, before they enter the battlefield, pre-combatant deployment training. However, I don't think we should even call uh, what they're doing in the military mindfulness. We should view it as nothing more than attention enhancement training, uh, essentially helping soldiers to be better sharpshooters and snipers. We're talking about programs that are designed, and I'm using their language here, optimize warrior performance to enhance their cognitive capabilities. Uh, and that translates to killing. I mean, come on. The military uh, will invest in anything that enhances and optimizes warrior performance. But the proponents of military mindfulness or mindfulness in the military call it a form of harm reduction. They say it will improve working memory capacity and emotional self-regulation thereby preventing soldiers in war zones from overreacting. Now, these are uh, not empty statements, and it's obviously better to distinguish combatants from children and innocent civilians. However, focusing on such benefits shifts attention away from the broader ethics and politics of using mindfulness to make trained killers more effective. And attention control for soldiers needs to be differentiated from Buddhist, what Buddhists call right mindfulness, where the aim is not improvements in mark, mark, marksmanship, uh, but to develop compassion and wholesome mental states and skillful, non-harming behaviors, which are put in the service uh, of all sentient beings, including those perceived as so-called enemies. So the U.S. military would surely have stopped investing in mindfulness training if it turned trained killers into models of compassion, refusing to follow orders 
when their conscious, uh, when their conscience uh, objected that to such orders. Yeah, it, it's this really weird thing, and and like I mentioned, I heard of this before. I was like, oh, okay, you know that makes sense. And I remember reading another book. I think it was uh, Russell Simmons' book. Um, he's you know he's big into yoga, but you know this was about mindfulness. And and uh, for anybody listening, I read I read his books before all the allegations came out and everything. But anyways, they often turn to this uh, yogi story of. Arjuna, I think, I can't remember, but I think you might have brought it up in your book. But anyways, it's a story about, uh, they use it, uh, it's a Buddhist story um, about this this warrior. And he questions it, and he's like, you know, uh, how am I supposed to, you know, just go kill people? And they use this as like, oh, hey, like, here's, you're, you're ethically going to war and killing people. And I, I remember, like, hearing this story, like, a few times from different, like, mindfulness teachers. I'm like... I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but, you know, I get it because I'm always trying to, you know, stay teachable. But this is why I, I really advocate for reading uh, and listening to arguments from both sides and all that. But, you know, from what from what you're saying, you know, I, I can see I could see this because it's almost like 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 what you mentioned. Right. Like the technique, separating the technique from like the philosophy. Right. And that's one of those things where they kind of pick and choose and say, okay, we'll take these parts of mindfulness because it'll help train better soldiers, better killers and everything like that. But if you look at, you know, cause I got really into Buddhist philosophy as a whole. And like, when you really look at it, it's like, is this really justifiable, right? Is, is you know, because especially with the United States and us being in so many offensive wars and all these other things and just occupying different places and we don't need to and people going and sacrificing their lives for you know, pretty much no reason. It's like, you know, uh, when I think of mindfulness and I think of, you know, the lessons in Buddhist philosophy, uh, you know, we, we have to sit back because like mindfulness is just, you know, for me these days, it's not only about uh, emotional regulation, but it's about trying to have a clearer head and slowing down and looking at things and questioning them, you know, uh, for my, you know, emotional regulation and just dealing with my mental health, it's questioning the thoughts that are coming in my head and stuff like that. But when you're, when you're teaching mindfulness to just let go of the pain from, you know, killing civilians or, or something like that, or, or letting go of, you know, uh, the emotions you feel, uh, around, you know, just some terrible things that you might be doing in war. It's like, uh, yeah, we're kind of taking something good and using it for bad you know what i mean so uh you know and that kind of goes back to what i was talking about with corporations like if if a company is doing something terrible like if if you know we're we're going in and there's a company who's just you know like an oil company and terrible for the environment and we're teaching you know their their executives or their management teams or whoever to be you know to be more mindful and deal with that stress like are we helping them grow a company and be more successful when they're doing something awful or you know a lot of wall street companies bring these in and all that um but but yeah so speaking speaking of uh you know buddhist philosophy i personally got into mindfulness um because i i found i i was constantly trying to fill this void right and as a recovering drug addict and alcoholic uh, I, I used substances until I got sober in, in 2012 to kind of fill that void. But I also saw how I would try to fill the void with relationships and money and all these other things and food, right? So Buddhism has this concept where there's like this little parable about the, you know, the hungry ghost, which is meant to teach people how we don't need, you know, money or things to fulfill. Uh, be fulfilled because you know the hungry ghost you know you eat it and then it's just gone again and so you're you're never kind of satisfying this craving so something that pushed me away from mindfulness is noticing how much money people are making in the industry and in the book you talk quite a bit about uh john cabot zinn and i'd assume i don't know his net worth but i assume he's a multi-millionaire right like he just started a master class and those master classes are hundreds of dollars just to sign up so i'm sure he's making a pretty penny um but he's not the only one you've also uh have like people like uh you know uh russell brand uh who's really big into mindfulness and yoga and stuff like that there's a social media star prince ea uh there's a bunch of others and they preach mindfulness but they're arguably part of the one percent right so it it doesn't seem to take into consideration how much 
is being made, right? Uh, and even apps like Headspace, and they just signed a deal with Netflix. So, so in your opinion, how do you how do you think? mindfulness leaders are able to deal with the cognitive dissonance of preaching that you don't need anything. You don't need money. You don't need stuff. You don't need millions of dollars in huge houses and cars. Like, how do you think they, they handle that dissonance, you know, while, while preaching, you know, this philosophy to, and we're living in a world where there's so many people with so little. This is a very interesting question. Uh, we know from the latest market research that Mindfulness is forecast to become a $2 billion industry by next year. And when it comes to these very wealthy mindfulness teachers, I think we have to consider cult-like dynamics as well as elements of narcissism and grandiosity among some of the mindful elite leaders. There's no doubt, based on even my own personal observations, that certain charismatic mindfulness teachers have a cult following and their followers rarely question or pose any sort of challenge to their authority or statements or claims so these leaders live a very live in a very cushy bubble and that group adulation that feeds their basically feeding their savior and messianic fantasies uh, just keeps the, the bubble intact uh, so these leaders sort of believe in their own PR and inflate their own sense of importance. And they truly believe that they have extracted the true essence of the Dharma, the Dharma meaning uh, code word for the Buddhist teachings, you know, the special sauce of Buddhism. And, and they're on a mission to spread the good news that their brand of mindfulness will even save the world and usher in, as, as John Cabot Zinn claims a new global renaissance. I mean, he's actually written that mindfulness has the potential of even solving the climate crisis, fake news, you name it. And when you really see yourself as a savior of humankind in the world, and show up for a few charitable uh, benefits here and there, it's much easier then to to manage your cognitive dissonance. Yeah, it's 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 complete madness to me. Like whenever I sit back and think about it, like uh, for all the listeners who are like you know into mindfulness or even you know know about like Buddhist philosophy and stuff like that, it's it's completely wild because as as you mentioned, you know there there's got to be there's got to be this kind of you know, uh, uh, these, these narcissistic traits and these things and just, you know, this, you know, uh, uh, grandiose ideas of who you are, which is completely, completely the opposite of what Buddhist teachings are, right? Where it talks about like getting rid of this, like, you know, uh, the sense of self and the ego and so much of, of it is about the ego and, you know, but, so it, it's really it's really weird. Like I get it, I, I definitely get it. Like with my uh, YouTube channel focusing on mental health and addiction and all that, I wanted. Uh, well, I'll put it this way: I, I battled a lot in my own head because I wanted to reach as many people as possible so I can help them. So I had to make more content. I had to get bigger and stuff like that. So, you know, I had to be like, okay, is this your ego, Chris, or are you trying to help? Right. So I do try to give people the benefit of the doubt, but something I keep asking myself and I hope all the listeners ask themselves too is like is this right like I'm really uh interested in effective altruism and stuff like that like how much money is enough right if 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 I'm somebody and part of my identity is you know I want to help I want to help others I want to help the world or you know whatever how much money do I actually need how big of a house do I need what kind of car do I need right how much do I need and how much of the rest should go towards helping others you know and I I am by no means a wealthy person I live in a small two bedroom apartment in Las Vegas I have a son you know <laughs> like I'm doing a podcast around my full time job and all that stuff, right? But it's something I, I think about, uh, you know, quite a bit. Like when we're talking about somebody like John Cabot Zinn or Russell Brand or Prince EA or Jay Shetty, right? Millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they're telling you, you know, you don't need social media and this can solve all the problems and all these other things. Like, 
how many houses do they have? How many cars do they have? How many, you know, uh, uh, expensive dinners do they have a week? How many expensive hotels and all these things? And how can you sit there and be like, okay, you know, I want this world to be a better place and I want to teach people that they don't need stuff while hoarding so much at the same time. It's just something I, I really hope people think about and question because uh, it's something I don't even know the answer to. Right. Like, I, I, don't, I don't know, like people should have things like we got to be motivated and, you know, we, we should have fun if we work and stuff like that. And um, we got to support our families. And, you know, I have a son, so I want him to have cool things and and all that. But it's just something I hope we we all kind of, you know, uh, reflect on. Um, but yeah, so so one of the, the, the core practices of mindfulness is emotional regulation and you're taught to manage emotions and for a lack of better words, uh, kind of quote unquote, ignore them. And using myself as an example, I used to struggle with major anger issues. And, you know, I, I've been diagnosed with a generalized, uh, generalized anxiety disorder and depression and mindfulness definitely, definitely helped me regulate these emotions, right? And I've learned that you need a, a, a certain amount of dissatisfaction and unhappiness to have the motivation to change, you know? So one of my favorite quotes, uh, it comes from this book, um, or it comes from the end of your book, rather, uh, where you say dissatisfaction and unhappiness are not impediments to revolution, they are its fuel. So obviously there are people who completely lose control and become violent and irrational. Uh, but as you wrote, I've learned that you need a certain amount of this dissatisfaction and unhappiness. Like we need some of these uh, negative emotions. So where, where would you say is this balance between managing your emotions while still having the motivation to go out there and take action and fight for systemic change? And if mindfulness isn't the solution, then what is? I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't take care of ourselves or that people don't derive some modest therapeutic benefits from mindfulness practices. And, and self-care can be a radical political act. But these are very superficial remedies to what are deep-rooted structural problems which are causing people to turn to mindfulness in the first place. So I'm really more concerned about how mindfulness has been deployed to help people tolerate and survive within systems of exploitation. In this regard, mindfulness reminds me of uh, what Paulo Freire, he wrote the book Pedagogies of the Oppressed, uh, calls uh, aspirin uh, practices. It's like giving someone that has cancer an aspirin so the problem isn't that using mindfulness for stress reduction and emotional self-regulation doesn't work. The problem is that it does work, but work in the service of whom and whose interests. Just as there's nothing wrong with treating depression, the problem is more at the macro level, the corporate interests, the market interests, in a case of Depression, the pharmaceutical industry has a vested interest in maintaining a narrative that depression is solely a dysfunction of the brain, a chemical imbalance. And the cure, of course, is prescribing uh, antidepressants. And similarly, the problem uh, with the mindfulness industry then is that its proponents have a vested interest in maintaining a narrow way of framing stress and anxiety and mental health in our society. Stress is seen as the result of poor lifestyle choices, uh, a failure of emotional self-regulation, and then the cure on offer is mindfulness. So the real challenge is that we need to develop more social and holistic approaches to mindfulness. Mindfulness programs and practices have to be uh, linked uh, in a dialectical relationship with social, historical, and political realities. We need to take a more holistic and collective view uh, when it comes to our mental well-being. And we should be looking at such issues as structural variables such as access to health care, quality schools and education, 
uh, having a living wage, a fair, safe, and meaningful uh, place uh, of employment, uh, the basic living conditions in which people live. Um, so individualized self-care, whether it be taking a mindfulness course, doing yoga, or even uh, taking a walk in the woods, are not the only options. Uh, uh, political participation, joining with others in uh, collective action to change the sociopolitical environment, that can actually mitigate stress and anxiety because... It empowers individuals to reclaim their sense of uh, agency and their capacity as democratic citizens. So seeking, you know, some sort of fleeting relief from stress and anxiety by listening to a guided meditation app on your iPhone or your smartphone on the subway is fine, but finding sources of meaning that go beyond just personal concerns uh, or merely merely just feeling good about oneself can also alleviate feelings of isolation and loneliness and hopelessness. Yeah, that was that was perfectly said, and that totally makes sense. Um, you know, something something that I, I, I it reminds me of is uh, loving kindness meditations. So uh, one of the ways I got you know my anger issues under control, or even you know just when I'm being very self critical and stuff like that, is loving kindness. So one of the practices is, you know, sending, you know, uh, like loving, loving kindness thoughts to, you know, people, you know, like, you know, uh, for example, I'll use my girlfriend or my son or whatever. And then you kind of broaden that circle, right? So it's like, okay, so I'm, you know, I'm, 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 you know, sending these kind thoughts to these people in my life, very close to me. Now, maybe the people in my neighborhood, now, maybe the people in my city, now people in my state, right now, people, you know, on the planet, and you're just kind of expanding these well wishes. And it's you, you repeat things in your head, kind of like, may you be happy, may you be free from harm, you know, may you be loved and things like that, right? So the reason why I bring that up is because that, you know, that practice, and I, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you said that there are so many benefits to mindfulness, but when I do that practice, it makes me not be so selfish and care about other people. So I guess what I'm getting at is kind of like you said is, you know, these, these societal issues, whether it's, you know, healthcare or inequality or racism or anything like that. So I, I don't understand how you can be kind of, you know, this, this person really into mindfulness while also being super capitalist and against, you know, things like uh, Medicare for all or free college, because, you know, if anything, mindfulness made me more socially aware and more empathetic and realize how much I need to care for other people. And it gets me out of that mindset of, oh, well, if you just, if you just worked harder and if you just quit looking at, you know, everything like you're the victim and, you know, and stuff like that. So that's, what's really strange to me. So I, I can look, I, I can, you know, I, I hope nobody listening is getting the wrong impression. Like, uh, I've written about it in my mental health books, like mindfulness has helped me so, so, so much. But I think as, as you mentioned, Ron, like, we need we need to use this tool in a better way and have a better conversation about it and the lessons we can learn from it and all these you know other things right to to make us a little bit more you know uh giving and sharing and caring about strangers that we don't know and realizing that there are people suffering and maybe if we're being more mindful and aware of this and feeling more connected we can come up with some solutions together um but yeah, uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, and I know we've been talking for a while, so I'm going to hit you with one final question. So uh, so going back to the issues with believing we're the source and the solution of all of our own problems, uh, I know a lot of us are torn about this, and this is something I wrestle with. Like, I, I know based on like my personal experience that I used to blame the world for all of my problems, and it, it fueled my depression and addiction. But once I started taking responsibility for my life and, you know, realizing how much control that I do have, you know, things got better. Like, although my life is a thousand times better than it used to be, though, uh, I'm fully aware that there are so many systemic issues as well. So I, 
I think about, you know, especially since uh, everything, you know, in 2020, like, even though I'm half black, I'm super privileged because I'm white passing and I'm uh, a straight male, right? So the more I learned about the myth of meritocracy in the United States, I started to understand how so many people can do everything right, but still not succeed. So I, I don't think that, you know, uh, you're, you're ever suggesting that we should all just roll over because we're not in control of our own lives or anything like that. So, so that's my question. Where, where do you think we find this balance between this internal locus of control, like recognizing the things that we can control, while also realizing that there are systems in place that are holding people back? Yes, you are absolutely right. I'm not suggesting that Caring for the self is a mistake and that we should all shirk uh, shirk uh, self-responsibility. And as uh, uh, the activist Andre Lord said, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that self-care can be an act of political warfare. Uh, so <laughs> in that way, it's our own subjectivity then it becomes a kind of a site of struggle. So, but this is a different kind of self-care. It's a form of self-care as resistance, um, as resistance, uh, rejecting the narratives and the cultural messages that I need to be uh, an entrepreneur of myself. I need to become a performative subject that needs to adjust and adapt and accept the status quo. So we need to be critical and astute in this respect. And one way of doing this is by turning critique outwards towards our socio-political institutions, as well as critically examining the uh, interlinkages, the systems of power that have uh, exacerbated uh, human suffering and collective stress, such as uh, systemic racism. And in order to decolonize mindfulness and s sever it from uh, the ties to the marketplace, we need to work towards uh, a new praxis that can facilitate this kind of critical reflection on the causes of our collective suffering and systemic injustices. So it isn't an either-or choice between self-care, self-responsibility, or social and political transformation. The problem with contemporary mindfulness is that it is adhered to a very, it is adhered to a highly individualistic view, and it's, it, it has served as a uh, a perfect ideological complement uh, to capitalism and neoliberalism, and this is what we need to re rebel against. And if mindfulness is going to be truly revolutionary, it must help people to see clearly how th their personal stresses and anxieties are linked to social, economic, and political realities. So mindfulness could take on an expanded scope and mission, uh, integrating the tension between personal and social transformation. And that right there is a great way to end this episode. That, that was very, very well said. Um, yeah, yeah, it, we, we need to, you know, look at these things and take care of ourselves and have this personal responsibility, but also, so it's not this either or thing. We also have to look at these, you know, social, political issues and all that. But anyways, thank you again so much, so much for your time, Ron. Uh, I, again, I, I really enjoyed the book. So glad that I read it again and we were able to link up and have you on. So everybody listening, everybody listening, like, check it out. Like, if you found any of this stuff interesting, uh, make sure you check out the, the description down below. Um, there will be uh, links to Ron on social media. Most importantly, his book, Mick Mindfulness. Like I know for a fact, all of you have heard about the mindfulness craze. You gotta check this book out, especially if you are more left-leaning and all that kind of stuff. Like this, this is a really, really important book because Mental health is such a crucial thing, but we have to also make sure that we're not turning a blind eye to uh, a lot of the systemic issues going on. So check out the book, McMindfulness. I will also link uh, Ron's personal website as well as 
uh, his his show uh, Mindful Cranks, which you got to check out as well. That'll be linked down below. All right. But anyways, that's all we got for this episode. So before I let you go, just a few reminders. Uh, if you're new, if you're not following me yet over on Instagram and Twitter, make sure you're following me at The Rewired Soul. And if you haven't yet, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast or you're following it if you're listening on Spotify. And over on Apple, if you're listening on Apple, just take two seconds, just two seconds and leave a rating and a review. All right. Uh, we're a few months into this podcast. Uh, I love talking with authors and everything like that. And since the podcast is new, rating it, reviewing it, following, subscribing, sharing on social media, all this stuff helps out with the algorithm, spreads the message, gets it out there in front of new people. And we can grow this thing together and build a nice, nice, fun little community. All right. But uh, lastly, if you want to support the podcast in any way, I have some people who ask down below, there's a link to uh, Patreon where you'll get access to exclusive content. Uh, you could also support the podcast by getting some of my books. Uh, as I mentioned, I've written books on mental health. They're available at the And, uh, there was also an affiliate link down below for better help online therapy. This is a service that I've personally used. It's affordable. It's all online. You can do it from your phone and, you know, uh, video chat, you can text all sorts of stuff right uh i personally do so many things not only do i practice mindfulness but i also do therapy and i go to 12 step meetings so it all kind of works together so if you're in need of therapy if you want to talk to a licensed professional check out the affiliate link down below for better help online therapy but anyways once again thank you again to ron for coming on the podcast make sure you check out his book mick mindfulness and i have some very cool episodes coming up so i appreciate you listening to this one and there are so many great ones coming up so have an amazing fantastic mindful rest of your day while also realizing there's still some, some systemic issues that we need to take care of but enjoy the rest of your day and i'll see you in the next one